welcome to Easter part three. You see, I don't want to leave Easter because the resurrection changes everything. This is the title of today's message, Run to the Tomb. Run to the tomb. That's the whole message today is run to the tomb. Everybody say it. Run to the tomb. When life becomes overwhelming, run to the tomb. When life gets confusing, run to the tomb. When life is difficult, when you feel weak, when you doubt God's love, when your sadness is trying to break your heart, run to the tomb. Why run to the tomb? Because when you get there, you'll find it's empty. It's a reminder, life has overcome death. That's my message today. Run to the tomb. You're dismissed. <laughs> oh, you know that's not true. It's a simple message. It is today. It's one message because I want us to practice this week running to the tomb. Because this is our message, people of faith. People who are Christ followers, when we give our lives to Christ, we are to wake up every morning and run to the tomb to see that it's empty and to be reminded that life has overcome death. Run to the tomb. Because it changes the way we see, the way we hear, and the way we feel, and the way we do. This is our faith. Well, over the course of 1,500 years, 40 human authors inspired by the Spirit of God. Farmers, fishermen, poets, shepherds, politicians, doctors, tax collectors, and kings wrote 66 books in three languages on three continents that we now call the Holy Scriptures, the Holy Bible. And it begins with a bang, a big bang. God says, let there be light. And those four words are still creating galaxies at the outer edge of the universe. And the Bible ends the way it begins, and God says, I am making all things new. Run to the tomb, friends, with your questions, with your distress, with your struggles, with your dreams, and with your hopes and fears. Run to the tomb because it's empty. Life has overcome death. God is making all things new. That is our faith. The empty tomb is the beginning of eternity. It's a reminder that God's kingdom has begun right now. And it reminds us that one day, he will wipe all tears from their eyes and there will be no more death, suffering, crying, or pain. These things of the past are gone forever. Everybody just smile right now. All wrongs will be made right. The empty tomb declares that God is with us and that we are with God. Run to the tomb. Now, what I love about scripture is between Genesis and Revelation, there's a lot of human drama. It's the ultimate soap opera, right? You've got the fall of man, the great flood, Israel's exodus out of Egypt. You've got judges and kings and the rise and fall of nations. There are villains and heroes and tragedies and comedies. But please hear me, all of these events recorded in the Holy Scriptures, there is one tipping point, there is one turning point, there is one defining moment, there is one inciting incident that changes everything. It's the empty tomb. Everything that predates the resurrection points forward and everything that postdates the resurrection points backwards. It's the day when heaven invaded earth, when eternity invaded time. It's the day when life defeated death. So I'll say it again and you're gonna hear it a few times today. Run to the tomb because it is empty. On Easter, we talked about faith is not the absence of doubt any more than courage is the absence of fear. In fact, you can't have one without the other. Remember, we talked about the father who asked Jesus, will you heal my son? And Jesus says, all things are possible. And I love the boy's father, what he says. It's so authentic. It's so unassuming. He says, I do believe. Help my unbelief. The father speaks for us all, does he not? Because all of us are a mixture of faith and doubt. Listen, as soon as I know all things, I'll let you know. Don't hold your breath. I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. All of us are card-carrying members of the Doubters Club because life is filled with whys on this side. There are, there are questions that are hard to answer. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why is there hate and racism and war and anger and injustice? When we get a difficult diagnosis or experience a broken relationship or grieve the loss of a loved one, Lord, I believe, 
but help my unbelief. And this is where Jesus' followers are after the crucifixion. Their minds are racing, their hearts are breaking, the compass needle is spinning. And on an early Sunday morning, Easter morning, women took spices they'd prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away. They go in, the body is missing. They're confused and puzzled. Two men suddenly appeared to them clothed in dazzling. I like the one version says they were, they were bedazzled. I guess that's where we got the, anyway, I'll move on. They had robes, bedazzled robes, and women were terrified, bowing their faces to the ground. And the men, the angels said, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? It's a good question because he's not there. He's risen, the tomb is empty. And then they say to the ladies, remember, remember what we told you, he told you back in Galilee that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of simple men and be crucified and that he would rise again on the third day. And I love this, then they remembered his words. I love this moment in scripture because I love this because their memories are jogged. Their memories are jogged. Now, we have a tendency to remember what we should forget and forget what we should remember. And that is often the difference between faith and doubt. Faith is a function of remembering God's promises and faithfulness. Doubt is forgetting what God said and what God has done. Part of running to the tomb is so God can jog our memory, so that we can be reminded of what God has spoken to us and about us and for us to be reminded of the prophet's words, to not be afraid. I have saved you, I've named you, you are mine. And when you have troubles, I am with you. When you cross rivers, you will not drown. When you walk through fire, you will not be burned because I am your God, I am your savior. When we run to the tomb, we are reminded that life has overcome death. The empty tomb jogs our memory. So this is my prayer. Every week when we come together, I just pray wherever we're at that God will just jog our memory. To jog our memory as we come together in worship and in fellowship and in speaking that God will jog our memory of his goodness, of his love, of his power, of his wisdom and his faithfulness because out there sometimes it's easy to forget. Now it says when they came back from the tomb, the ladies see the tomb is empty. And so they're reminded of what Jesus said. So they go back and they tell these things to the 11 and to all the others, they go back and say, the tomb is empty. I think it's kind of cool that women are the first witnesses of the resurrection. I think that's cool. But as they share the news, guess what? Guess what? Guess what? The apostles are members of the doubters club as well. They did not believe the women. In that culture, a woman's word was not taken seriously, but the women were right. And men, have we learned that is the truth always? <laughs> yeah, there you go. I need some women amen and on this one. We have learned women are always right, whether they are or not. They didn't believe the women, but there was one. There was one who was curious. There was one that was like, could this be true? And Luke records that Peter was the one that was like, could this be true? So the scripture records that he got up and he brewed some coffee and he fixed some eggs and bacon and he did the laundry and he practiced his daily yoga and he ran some errands and then eventually he strolled over to the tomb. That's not what Luke records. Here's what Luke records. Peter got up and ran to the tomb. He ran to the tomb. I love those four words. Friends, when life doesn't make sense, when we're feeling weak, when we're tempted to let worry rule our world, when discouragement is nipping at our heels, follow the example of Peter. Normally we say, don't follow the example of Peter, but this time do. Peter did what all the apostles should have done. He ran to the tomb, for it was empty, and life had overcome death. I'll say it again. It's a simple message today. When circumstances don't make sense, run to the tomb. When you feel like your life is falling apart, run to the tomb. When you're wrestling with doubt, run to the tomb. When all else fails, run to the tomb. Because the, the empty tomb is the answer to a thousand questions, and the empty tomb is the solution to a thousand problems. 
So the tomb is empty, friends. Life has overcome death. And so our call, our privilege is to run to the tomb. The empty tomb changes everything. You know, in Washington, D.C., uh, on April 14th, 1755, General Edwards Braddock sailed up the Potomac River to a sleepy little town called Georgetown. This is where Braddock anchored his ship. If you like history, this is also where he recruited a 23-year-old named George Washington. Now, I've been to, I've been to D.C. a million times. I love that town. If you drive west on Constitution Avenue, right where it turns into the Theodore Roosevelt Bridge, just a stone throw from the Lincoln Memorial, there is a nondescript stone well with a small historical marker. I'll show it to you. Never seen it before. I did, I, you just pass, it's easy to miss. There's a manhole cover on top of it. There's a ladder inside of it. And 16 feet below the surface is a rock. It's called Braddock's Rock. It's a place where General Edward Braddock anchored his ship. It's the initial point for the earliest surveys of the city. If you look at old maps, it's called the key of all keys. Why? Because from that moment, from that place, it established the coordinate system for the entire city. Every principal meridian that divides east and west, every baseline from, that divides north and south is measured from Braddock's Rock. It's the key of all keys. Now hold that thought. Hold that thought. 2,000 years ago, Jesus of Nazareth was betrayed, arrested, and crucified at a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And in first century Judea, death by crucifixion was common. Archaeologists estimate that probably about 1,000 crucifixions per year happened around the time of Christ. So the crucifixion of Jesus between two criminals was par for the course. Lots of people died on Roman crosses, but please hear me, one per, only one person predicted their death and pulled it off, and his name is Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the resurrection and the life. And when he died on that cross, his body was placed in a tomb belonging to Joseph of Arimathea. Can I ask you a question? Who borrows a tomb? Who borrows a tomb? Well, I'll tell you who. It's someone who's only going to need it for three days. That's who does it. 700 years before the birth of Christ, the prophet Isaiah identifies the Messiah this way. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. He would have two graves, the Messiah. Well, who has two graves? Every person crucified by the Romans would have been assigned a grave with the criminals, which fulfills half the prophecy. The other half is fulfilled when a rich man named Joseph of Arimathea offers his tomb. And so Jesus is placed in that tomb. A rock is rolled in front of it. The tomb is sealed, protected by a Roman guard because there was rumor that somebody was going to try to steal the body. The rumor backfires because the guards who were meant to prevent something from happening actually provide circumstantial evidence that it didn't happen. No one stole the body it was a supernatural moment and on the third day the women go to the tomb and as they approach the tomb they notice the rock is rolled away and the angels declare that the tomb is empty all of that to say the empty tomb is our key of keys it's where every baseline and truth is measured that rock that was rolled away is how we measure time and eternity life and death the empty tomb. This is where God asserts his authority, asserts his sovereignty, where heaven invades earth. I want to declare something today, okay? We don't live in happily ever after land. We believe in something much bigger and better and stronger and longer. We believe in happily forever after. Amen. Because the tomb is empty. Run to the tomb. Everybody say it. Run to the tomb. Christianity is not a moral code. It's not just a moral code. Now, again, we practice the teachings of our Savior, too. We model it. We love our enemies. We love our neighbors. We bless those who curse us. We go the extra mile. But the empty tomb is not behavior modification, friends. Jesus didn't come just to make bad people good. He came to bring dead people to life, and I might add, abundant life. Christianity is not just a religion. It's a relationship. When I growing up in church, I remember the song. I'm not going to sing it. 
though I want to so badly. <laughs> Alfred Ackley wrote in 1912 this beautiful hymn, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice a cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. In the church I grew up with, there was a lot of vibrato. He lives, he lives. That's the way, no, no, no. No, that's, oh no, I would do it more in a smooth jazz style, but that's just, a, that's the way they used to sing it. 2,000 years ago, the world woke up to an empty tomb. The sinless son of God, crucified on a cross, conquered the grave on the third day. And when Jesus walked out of that tomb, all bets were off. All things are possible. So like Peter, will you run to the tomb? The Bible says that all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What a beautiful thing. But once you're saved, it's important to run to the tomb every day. For the tomb reminds us that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. We daily run to the tomb, for it is the genesis to revelation of our hope. The reason I say that is because Pastor Craig Rochelle wrote a book one time called The Christian Atheist. <laughs> Sounds like an oxymoron, right? But he says it's about people who've called on the name of the Lord but are still living in fear, still living it's strangled by worry. They have no joy. They have no purpose. It's a book about people who've called on the name of the Lord to be saved, but they've forgotten that the tomb is empty. They've forgotten to run to the tomb. They are not living like the grave is empty. The resurrection is not just something that we celebrate one day a year with Easter bunnies and Easter bonnets. If you don't believe me, just watch this for just a moment. Easter, that's a weird tradition. Easter, the day Jesus rose from the dead, what should we do? How about eggs? <laughs> oh, well, what does that have to do with Jesus? All right, we'll hide them. I don't follow your logic. Don't worry, there's a bunny. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I had to show that. Easter, I don't know where we got the bunnies and the eggs and the high, I don't know, I don't know. But Easter is more than that. Because the, the resurrection is something that we should celebrate every day, every moment, because... The Bible says the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us. Wow. That's not me. That's scripture right there. So every day, the first thing we do is run to the tomb. I had a little fun this week with this message because I could have gone a lot of different directions. But I was thinking, you know, this rhythm of running to the tomb. Sometimes you, you just need to pull a Dr. Seuss. And say, when I'm mad or wearing plaid, when I'm bad or feeling sad in a bag or playing tag, my joy will be glad for the tomb is empty. Life has overcome death. On a boat or with a goat or in the rain or on a train with a fox in a box or when my stocks take a flop, when I can't find my socks, I still won't be shocked for the tomb is empty. Life has overcome death. With a mouse or in a house in the sun and having fun when it snows, I just don't know here or there or anywhere. I'm no worse for wear for the tomb is empty. Life has overcome death. I could keep going, and I will. When life gets tough and the road gets rough, when my bills aren't paid and my in-laws stayed, and when the doctor calls and I take a fall, I'll still recall the tomb is empty and life has overcome death. One more. When my computer does a crash or I fall in the trash when I'm all out of cash or I get a bad rash, I will not dash for the tomb is empty and life has overcome death. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Okay, let me wrap this up. I got a question for you. If you were to lay bets 2,000 years ago, if you were to lay down bets, if you were placing bets on whether in 2,000 years the Roman Empire would exist or this thing called Christianity would exist, 2,000 years ago, you would probably place your bets on the Roman Empire because Rome ruled the world. Jesus had a handful of followers <laughs> 
and they struggled, they were unschooled, they weren't exactly first round draft picks, if you know what I mean. Jesus and his followers seemed irrelevant. At that point, it seemed just like a blip on the radar screen of history. But here we are, 2,000 years later. And you may eat an occasional Caesar salad, but I bet you you can't name seven Caesars. The Roman Empire is long gone, but two billion people claim to be followers of Christ in our world. Two billion, one-third of the world's populations identify with a person named Jesus of Nazareth. What's that about, and how did that happen? The only explanation I have is the empty tomb. If the tomb wasn't empty, Christianity would have been a blip on the radar screen of history. But it's empty, friends, two billion people. So let me wrap this up right now, okay? Let us run to the tomb, and if it's empty, start living like it. The tomb is empty, friends, so if God is for us, who can be against us? The tomb is empty, friends, so he who began a good work in you will carry it to completion. The tomb is empty, so I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. The tomb is empty, so surely his goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. The tomb is empty, friends, and we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. For the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. The tomb is empty. So I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And on the mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest wines, and he will swallow up death forever and will wipe away the tears from all faces. Friends, the tomb is empty. Surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. So run to the tomb with your doubts and your questions, and you'll see it's empty. Run to the tomb and remember all his benefits. When you run to the tomb and you can't see God, just remember he's at work all along. Let's run to the tomb, friends, but let's not run alone. Let's run with our fellow brothers and sisters. The tomb is empty, life has overcome death, the banquet table is ready, so let's go. For we serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer, and just the time we need him, he's always near. Rob, why don't you come up, and uh, I want us to sing. I don't care if you can sing or not. The Bible says make a joyful noise. It doesn't say sing on key, Okay. <laughs> As we run to the tomb, may we sing a little louder. May we party a little bit greater as we thank the Lord for the empty tomb. Let's run to the tomb. Why don't you stand?